if I'm, if I'm sitting alone at home in my comfortable chair in the den with my feet propped up on the ottoman on a cold, rainy day with a fire going in the fireplace. I know you can't wait to know where I'm going with this. <laughs> I'm sitting there trying not to fall asleep and just trying to read my Bible or maybe a recent bestseller. It makes absolutely no sense for me to try to read in a dark room. It makes no sense that if I have a table lamp, it makes no sense for it to be hidden under the table. It needs to be up on a lampstand with the switch turned on. It works. I guess it doesn't work. <laughs> it makes, it, you read better if the light's turned on. When it's turned on, I can see the words on the pages, and I can find my glasses hidden under a stack of papers. And maybe my light will be useful to someone else in the room. It's hard to find your way in the dark. A light illuminates the words on the page. A street light shows you the way at night, and the light of Christ will help you escape the darkness of disappointment, despair, and doubt. It is much easier and safer to find your way when there is some kind of light guiding your way, even when that light is so bright that it shows up all your personal peculiarities, your idiosyncrasies, your warts, the hair in your ears, and your nervous mannerisms. That's enough about me, let's move on. <laughs> You've just heard from the Gospel of Matthew in which Jesus refers to his disciples as salt and light. Note that he's not asking them to become salt and light, they already are. And they are already blessed as we read last week in those poignant words of the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount. Now, there are plenty of times in the New Testament when Jesus is not so kind and complimentary to his disciples. But on this occasion, he offers these bold words to a group that don't have two denarii to rub together, people who have no land or titles. They are just simple fishermen and day laborers. And then Jesus warns them not to lose their saltiness. Translation, do not let the stress of poverty, persecution, and oppression by those in power let you stray from the path on which Jesus has led you so that you may continue to add flavor and favor to the lives of your brothers and sisters and to be a light for them to follow. In the Bible, salt was used not only to preserve and add flavor to foods, it was also used to seal an agreement or a covenant between two people. And it was said that, a, that an agreement sealed with salt would last forever. Salt has sustaining and healing powers. It was sometimes used in ancient days to rub on newborn babies for health reasons. As a young physician, I served a year at an army field hospital located on the coast of the South China Sea in Vietnam. While there, I saw hundreds of young soldiers treated for serious wounds they had sustained in battle. Although it was heartbreaking to see their suffering and their maimed bodies as they were rolled from the rescue helicopter to the emergency room, most of them were very young and healed fairly quickly. After they had been sewn up and were discharged from the hospital, my surgical colleagues encouraged them to go down to the beach and wade out into the sea where the salt water would help facilitate their healing wounds. Salt is good. Salt is healthy and can be healing. Just don't tell your cardiologist I said that. What does it mean to be called salt of the earth? 
Dictionaries say it would refer to a good and honest person, an individual considered as representative of the best and noblest elements of society. For a number of years, I worked with a special nurse. Her name was Sheila. Although she was highly qualified and experienced in her field, her finest qualities were her bright countenance, her total dedication and loyalty to the principles of her profession, and her almost painful honesty and forthrightness. She was an organizer, a doer, a people manager of the best kind. She could give you her undivided attention despite how busy she was at work. And if she did not know the solution for a given problem, she would go home and pray to God that night. And usually an answer was forthcoming. Sheila was salt of the earth, and I loved her as such and would trust her with my life. Maybe some of you have had a Sheila in your life someone whose caring and friendship was unwavering, someone whose benevolence has profoundly affected you in ways you'll never forget, someone Jesus would call salt and light. Or maybe some of you have been the salt for others, maybe serving at more than a meal, or meals on wheels, or reading to a child at Shady Grove Elementary School, or to someone who is blind, visiting a sick friend, or taking her for a doctor's visit, or just holding her hand in the memory care unit. Just as he warned his disciples, Jesus does not want us to lose our saltiness. Do not let the complexities of life stand in the way of being a comfort and a light for others. Do not be afraid to stand in the light that God shines even when you feel exposed and vulnerable and unsure if you're doing the right thing or doing it in ways that reflect God's will and not your own. A couple of weeks ago, I attended a meeting with the bishop along with other deacons from our, di our diocese, during which we were asked to think about where we have been and where we have come to presently in our lives as deacons. And more specifically, we were to reflect on our ordination vows, one of which is to interpret to the church the needs, concerns, and hopes of the world, and to be a bridge between the church and the world. It sounds like no small task, but there's certainly no shortage of needs and concerns in today's world. We need look no further than our own city, where 25 to 30 percent of families are living at or near the poverty level, where violent crime just seems to never cease. Our government has not been able to find ways to deal fairly and justly with those fleeing the violence in their own country and seeking asylum in ours, and our leaders can't seem to find a middle ground on important issues or stop the divisiveness that plagues our country. Jesus calls us to be salt and light. Sometimes that may mean being a bit confrontational. If we sense that someone has taken a path that may lead to danger or self-destruction, or if we perceive that their actions do not promote justice and equality, Sometimes it means to speak the truth in love or to have someone speak it to us when our actions do not reflect the salt and light that Jesus wants from us. Bible commentator Caroline Lewis has said that to become salt and light will necessarily mean that we are to think about our personal default setting, our own spiritual compass, it means thinking about who we are now as children of God, where God is in our lives now, and where God wants us to go. It is possible that we are caught up in too much comfort, conformity, and complacency when what Jesus really needs from us is to be salt and light, and that the salt may sting 
and the light just might expose what we do not want to see. Where does the world need salt and light today? Where does our country, our city, our church family need salt and light and healing? Who among us still dwells in the darkness of pain and suffering or the loss of a loved one? Most likely there are many, some whose issues are known to many and are being addressed, but others whose pain is known only to God. Our job as Christians is to seek them out and to allow the light of Christ to shine through us, to be a salve for their wounds. If we can provide salt and light to those in need, the words of the psalmist may pertain to us. Your word is a lantern to my feet and a light upon my path. Nicholas Wolterstorff is a theologian, author, and Yale professor, as well as a grieving father. And he had this to say to a would-be caregiver. To comfort me, you have to come close. Come sit beside me on my morning bench. We can do that. We can be salt and light to others to help them see and help them heal.